Alright guys, today we're going to talk about hypersaturated solutions, precipitate reactions, and actual crystallized product from the reactions themselves. We're going to cover how these reactions take place, what kind of conditions are needed, and why the products are important to us, both financially and everyday life itself. So let's get right down to it. Now we know what you're thinking. Well, it's a hypersaturated solution. Why does it matter to me? Well, it's actually super simple, and I'm sure you've actually already made one. I want you to think back to the first time you were a kid making Kool-Aid, how excited you were. You pour in your flavor powdering into the water and you pour in a bunch of sugar to make it sweet. Except when you put in the sugar, you put in too much. You're stirring it up but there's a bunch of sugar in the bottom that's just not dissolving in the water. When your mom comes by to see you making Kool-Aid for the first time, she says that you put too much sugar in and that it's going to be way too sweet to drink. Well that's the same thing as a hypersaturated solution. In essence, a hypersaturated solution is when the solvent, in this case the water, can no longer dissolve any more of the solute that you added, in this case the sugar. See, water has a wonderful property where it likes to bind and dissolve stuff that you put into it, such as sugars and salts. It will break apart these molecules ionically if it can in salts case, and it will pick them apart and hold them in suspension in the water. But what happens is, water can only dissolve so much of the solute just on sheer size alone and the amount of volume of water that you have. So when you put too much solute in there, they're just going to sink to the bottom when there's excess. That is exactly what's happening in the hypersaturated solution in terms of your Kool-Aid. We're going to be doing the exact same thing today in our experiment, except instead of Kool-Aid, we're going to be using a common household item called borax. Now borax is an actual laundry detergent of sorts that you add to your wash, which is used to clean up your clothes and break apart the dirts and stuff. Molecularly, borax is actually just a salt. It's a sodium borate, solu or sodium borate salt that's hydrated, and it's actually a precipitate itself and forms from really hypersaturated solutions, just like your Kool-Aid was with the sugar. So we're going to recreate those conditions where borax forms naturally in our own homes. Don't worry, it's totally safe. You can handle all the products and everything you need can be at the store. So right now I'm going to put up a list on the screen for you guys to go get of all the materials that you'll need to conduct this experiment at home if you want to. If not, you can just follow along with me because I'm going to go through all the steps with you guys. So here's the list. I'm going to go gather my materials. Alright, you've gone through and you've gotten all the materials you're going to need to do the experiment. Excellent. So the next step is explaining what actually is going to take place when we perform the experiment itself. So as I mentioned before, the hypersaturated solution is when you dissolve too much solute into the solution itself to where the solvent, in every, almost every case, water, is no longer able to suspend the solute itself in a dissolved state. So you're going to have some kind of aggregation of your solute at the bottom to where it can't be dissolved anymore. At this point in time, your solution is referred to as hypersaturated. It's holding too much as it is solution to dissolve any more and all the excess will be at the bottom. Now, what we're working with today is borax. As I told you before, it's a hydrous sodium borate salt. And it's not like your everyday table salt, sodium chloride. That's a much more basic structure and borax is a little bit more complicated, but at its core, it's still just a hydrous salt, essentially. And it forms due to these uh, hypersaturated precipitation reactions and it'll form in dry lake beds and stuff like that, but that's not important. So we'll get down to it. So you want to form your precipitate crystals out of this, but you, you don't know how yet. You know you're going to put a bunch of borax into solution and it'll become hypersaturated, but what then? Well, that's where the next component comes into place and it's very important, the pipe cleaner. So the pipe cleaner is just your everyday little craft item you'll find at a grocery store, a craft store, anything like that. It's used for a bunch of different stuff. But what's so important about it is that it's covered in these little, small, soft hairs, sort of, or wool or fibers, it doesn't matter. Now these little fibers on the pipe cleaner itself give it an incredibly high surface area. Because each one of those little hairs has a bunch of surface area on itself multiplied by the tens of thousands of the hairs or fibers on the little wire itself. So when you put the borax into the solution, you're going to mix it up, you're going to make it hypersaturated. And at this point in time, in terms of salts, which is different than the sugar from the Kool-Aid, I want to actually exalt out of the solution itself and recrystallize into the borax crystals of salt. So to do this, you're going to need some kind of medium to grow the crystals themselves, and that's where the pipe cleaner comes in. 
So when you have a hypersaturated solution, it wants to grow these crystals out of the solution itself. You're going to need them to have something to grow onto. They can't just form in the middle of the solution of water and drop down. It's not going to be beneficial. They'll be too small. They'll fall right down into the aggregation of the excess that you have at the bottom already. So what you do is you're going to be suspending pipe cleaners into your solution. And the high surface area allows the formation of something called microcrystals, which will be tiny, tiny borax crystals onto the fibers of the pipe cleaner. Once these uh, microcrystals grow onto the pipe cleaner, they can grow larger and larger. And the longer time goes on, the more borax dissolves out of the solution, which is beneficial for the water because it can no longer hold that much. And it'll crystallize in the pipe cleaner. See, when it crystallizes out, it wants to get the most salt out of the solution to make it come back down to a stable, saturated state. When a solution is hypersaturated, it's not stable. It wants to get rid of those solutes that are dissolved as quickly as possible. And by providing it somewhere to go with the pipe cleaner, you're just expediting the process exponentially so it'll have some place to crystallize. And you're giving it a way to get rid of those crystals out of the solution as quickly and efficiently as possible. So we're going to go through the steps now of what you need to do to set up your apparatus to actually grow these crystals one by one. I'm going to put the steps up on the screen so you can pause it and you can set up your little station or get your materials ready as you need. But I'm going to go through if you want to watch me and then replay it, whatever you need to. But we're going to go through step one right now. Alright guys, so you've got all the materials ready to move on to step one, which is actually making your pipe cleaner shape to suspend into the solution later. So like I said, it's really imperative that we use something with high surface area for those microcrystals to start growing on and form the larger crystals later, aka the pipe cleaners. So like I said, once you have your pipe cleaners, you can start bending them into any shape you want to. That's the beauty of this. You know you're going to be growing some kind of crystals out of the solution. You're going to precipitate them. So you can form any kind of shape you want. I know a lot of people use initials or trees in the seasons and the fall seasons and winter seasons. People make like window hangers out of these and stuff. And they'll make like snowflakes and really pretty trees because they're just kind of nice and aesthetically pleasing. So you can make, you know, whatever you want to. Shapes, diamonds, rectangles, doesn't matter. But for this one, I chose to make something a little bit more simple, which was an actual just globular like nugget of it. So this is just a really dense ball of a bunch of pipe cleaners wrapped around each other. So it has a really, really, really high surface area. It has a bunch of little grooves that they can grow into, low land spaces. But you're going to make your shape that you want. After that, you're going to get some fishing wire, as aforementioned, fishing line, and you're going to tie it to one of the pipe cleaners. You're going to double, triple knot it, make sure it's really tight, you can pull on it, it doesn't come off. Once you have that, you know it's not going to be able to fall down in solution, because it will get heavy, because you're going to be growing crystals on this. So you tie one end of your fishing line to your pipe cleaner itself, so it can be suspended, and then tie the other one to your pencil, or in this case, I used a skewer, like for shish kebabs, and I taped it at the top to make sure nothing came loose. I tied it a couple times and sometimes it just kind of comes loose. It's not a fishing pole, so it's not like what this is made for, but it'll do. We'll make it work. So you have tied your shape to your uh, skewer or your pencil to where it can be suspended now. So you're going to notice that it hangs freely. And that's really important because you don't want your shape or your, in this case, ball, touching the bottom of the sides of whatever container you use to crystallize in because you want to keep this suspended in solution and it'll give the place for the crystals to actually dissolve onto without being near the walls or the bottom. So once you have your shape made and you're ready to put in solution, the next step is obviously to make the solution itself. All right, so you've made your shape itself for your pipe cleaners, so you're going to be able to have something to crystallize on. The next step is to start preparing your solution. So. I guess it's time to actually show you what the borax is. This is the borax itself. It's literally just a white powder. Like I said before, it's used as a laundry detergent. It's totally safe to touch. It feels just like table salt, kind of coarse like sand. You don't have to worry about burning yourself. There is such a thing as salt burn, but in this case, if you're seeing me touching it, it's fine. It's safe to handle. If you want to use gloves, that's entirely up to you. But like I said, there's no real worry about getting any kind of serious injury from this. Obviously, don't lick it or anything dumb like that. But it's used as a laundry detergent itself. And these are actually just a bunch of, a bunch of crushed up crystal itself, which is why it feels so coarse like sand. 
But you're going to be dissolving this into water. So as I'm talking, I have water boiling on a stove right now because I don't actually own a Bunsen burner nearby. So the ratio for you to make your solution is three tablespoons of borax itself for every one cup of water you use. So you're going to be using some kind of container to hold your solution. I'm choosing this vase for flowers of some kind. But it looks like it probably holds about six cups of water. I'm going to choose to use four. So that puts me at 12 tablespoons of borax itself. And rough estimate, a cup of water is about 238 milliliters, I remember, and a tablespoon of borax is equal to 15 grams. So you're going to have 45 grams of borax for every cup of water. So, like I said, it all depends on which kind of container you use. I'm going to be using about four-ish cups because you don't want to fill it up too high because you know you're going to be adding up borax into it so that takes up space so you have to remember to accommodate space to put in the borax it'll take up actual volume in your container container itself excuse me but once the water is done boiling you bring it in you're going to pour the water into the cup itself first and then you'll add borax periodically stirring as you go through so what happens is you're going to want to make sure that you don't add too too much too quickly you have to let the solution dissolve it or the solution i'm sorry you have to let the water dissolve it as you add it and then you're going to be able to gauge how much you need to add more to where it's just to the point where it can't accept anymore because you don't want to add far too much borax and just waste it and have about a half an inch sitting on the bottom because that wouldn't solve anything so once your water's boiled you bring it in be safe obviously you're boiling water you're on hot things use gloves you're going to pour in the desired amount of water that you think you're going to need to where you can actually suspend your shape into it. So I may actually need to use more than four cups now that I look at this, four or five, but I'm going to put up the ratio of how much borax you're going to need per cup of water onto the screen in the meantime. So once your water is boiled, you can move on to the next step, which is actually preparing the solution itself by mixing in the borax. All right. You got your water boiled, it's all ready to go. Like I said, it's very temperature sensitive, so you wanna make sure that your water is hot as possible because it will dissolve the borax as quickly as possible. And the, more, the faster you dissolve the borax, the more you can get in, the more saturated your solution will be, the better crystals you'll get. So, like I said, it's one cup of water for every, or it's three tablespoons of borax for every one cup of water. And I'm gonna guess I'm gonna need about three to four cups of water. So you get your measuring cup as stated in instructions. I'm going to pour out two to begin with. There's two cups of water. Pour it in. Be very careful. It's still hot, obviously. It just got out of being done boiled. Um, we'll go with three just to be safe on mine. It's all up to whichever container you use and how long your string is. You just have to make sure that your pipe cleaner shape doesn't touch the sides of the bottom when you're suspending it. So I'm doing, oh that should be plenty. I'm doing three cups of boiling water. So that means I'm going to need about nine tablespoons of borax. But again, you're making a hypersaturated solution and this isn't precisely as much as you're going to need. You're going to have to add borax as much as it takes. That's just kind of the ratio that I've been noticing. So what you're going to do is you're going to actually we're going to add the borax first so you have your borax nearby and you start getting tablespoons of borax and just one at a time you know you're going to need nine so i start off with about five to be safe you add your borax now you just stir you're going to notice it's very cloudy. It's going to be a little bit harder to see, especially with that in the way. But you just stir. It's very hot. You just pour boiling water in there. You have to be careful. But you'll notice if you look down near the bottom, you can try to look and see if there's any more borax filing around at the bottom and swirling. As soon as you don't see any, you know it's been dissolved. And you're going to notice the solution will get more clear the more you stir. What you're looking for for a hypersaturated solution is it will be a little bit cloudy and you're going to notice that it'll have stuff spinning entirely or constantly because it can no longer dissolve that much solid. So I have a half a cup here and I know for this I'm going to need 
about four more tablespoons, which is about half of the half cup. So you pour that in again. And the whole point is just make this hypersaturated. As much borax as you need to use, as much as you need to use. So you keep stirring, you go ahead, and you get the point that I'm getting at. You need to do this until finally you see that there are pieces of borax still floating around suspended in solution. And it's going to be kind of a, tri a trial and error the first time you do it. But you just need to make sure that you can suspend as much borax in there as possible, but not to the point where you have too much excess on the bottom. And the next step is to actually just take your pipe cleaner shape, whatever it is, and suspend it into the solution. So, oh, that was a little short. There we go. You're going to want to kind of lower it down in, kind of like you'd be making tea with like a tea bag. You have to make sure that your pipe cleaner gets heavy enough that it where it wants to sink into the solution itself. Because it has to be heavy enough to where it's submerged all the way in the solution, but it's not touching the walls. It's not touching the walls and it's not touching the bottom. Because if you're touching those walls in the bottom, there will be slight crystallization around those areas just because of the sheer amount of borax in the solution. So once you have it in, you can actually almost see it. It's a little bit clear, which is nice. You just let it sit. There's an optional step that is entirely up to you. You can add something like jello liquid food coloring to this when you're stirring in after the borax, and it'll give your crystals an actual color, which is super cool. And I'm going to show you guys that because I've prepared a couple of these just to make sure it works. But again, you're noticing that the solution is becoming a little bit more clear, but it's much cloudier than it was before because it has all that dissolved salt in it. So once you have your pipe cleaner shape in there, make sure it's nice and heavy that it'll stay suspended in solution. You let it sit. And I found best it will start crystallizing within a couple hours, but let it sit overnight, 24 hours. So I'm going to let this sit for a day and come back. So let's let it crystallize and it'll all precipitate out onto the walls and the pipe cleaners. So let's check in 24 hours. All right, you made your solution. You suspended your pipe cleaners. The best thing to do now is just wait. Give it about two or three days. Just let it sit in a really stable place with not a lot of movement because you don't want to disrupt the crystallization. And just let these crystals dissolve out of the solution on your pipe cleaners and you'll have a beautiful crystal aggregation in no time. We've gone from hypersaturated solutions to this precipitation reactions to crystallization and aggregation altogether. You can now understand why it's important because we use all sorts of different salts in everyday life between diets and other uses. So now we've gone over these kind of processes, you can appreciate how they happen and why it's so important for these things to happen because we really do need salts in our life. Not that I'm saying salts are the most important, but sometimes it's cool to know these little things. And this is better than a regular video lesson in the class anyway, to do something hands-on and have fun about it. So if you guys have any questions, definitely ask me in class or email me about this. I'll be happy to tell you all about it because this is a really cool process. Alright, have a good day guys.